butt in. Okay? Okay. I know you're excited about that. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, you have about three minutes. <clears throat> okay. Three minutes. So at the top of the hour here, what's happening, Garrett, is they'll do a, um, a weather, uh, usually a traffic report, a couple of commercials, and then you'll hear this music, which is the music bumper for the show. Come on. So you're on vacation here in Hawaii and you end up in a radio studio. No. Oh, man. With no windows. Uh, no windows. <laughs> Do you have windows in yours? No, but I'm, you know, I'm in Hawaii and I end up oh, in a okay. radio studio. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> well, you're looking at a green wall and so you can't see, but the green... We're, we're in London. We're, there's a... Well, <laughs> the, 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 ah. the skyline is there. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Something big has appeared behind yeah. you. Yeah, actually, we shouldn't have worn these blue shirts if we have a blue sky. No, we're dark enough. We're, um, you're bad. I'm pretty good, so it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Fair enough. So do you have to adhere to the AM radio commercial breaks, or do you have unlimited time? We're, we're Commercial, not underwritten. Okay. Full on, so it's pretty uh, eclectic and freeform. <laughs> okay, we should be about one minute here. This is the running time for the show on that clock. Oh, yeah, okay. So at 3.58, uh, 4.58, we're in trouble. Welcome to Think Tech Radio's Focus on Asia Tuesday. Today's segment is Asia in Review with your host, international business lawyer, David Day. Good afternoon. We are live and this is KGU's Wall Street Business Network. You can join the conversation by calling us at area code 808-296-5467. And our topic today, we're going to be talking about Margaret Thatcher. After all, the Iron Lady is no more. And to help us do that, uh, we have in the studio with us a very special guest, uh, a friend of mine and someone who can provide a lot of light on, the, on this topic, and that is Mr. Garrett Grace. And uh, Garrett is a former resident of Ireland in the UK, uh, spent some time in London. Uh, he's That's right. A, he, he's, a, he's a relatively famous local banker. And, uh, oh, I wouldn't say that, David, <laughs> but uh, wonderful to be here today. It's great. It's great to have you. And uh, I don't want to I don't want to cut short your service in the Australian Navy. So uh, you, you have got the uh, UK brand all over you there. How Definitely you? A, uh, com a Commonwealth person, though still an Irish rebel as well. <laughs> okay. Well, as, uh, as some of you uh, know, and, and then there's a large part of the, the audience, perhaps uh, you don't know, that uh, Margaret Cor Thatcher's career has been one of the most remarkable of modern times. And she was born in 1925 in a small uh, town called Grantham That's in, right, yes. in, uh, in England. And uh, she, she rose to become one of the, the major 
political leaders and uh, the first woman to lead a major Western democracy. Uh, she won three successive uh, general elections and served as the British Prime Minister for more than 11 years. And uh, that was the time period from 1979 to 1980, a record which is unmatched in the 20th century. Margaret Thatcher, during her term of office, uh, reshaped almost every aspect of British politics. Reviving the economy, uh, she reformed outdated institutions, and she reinvigorated the nation's foreign policy. She challenged and did much to overturn the, the, the psychology of decline which Britain, Britain suffered uh, during the early part of uh, the post-war period from uh, the end of World War II up until the time that, uh, the time that she took office. Yeah, and David, in particular, the, the 1970s were a period of terrible turmoil in, in England as um, the unions um, expressed their strength uh, by controlling the, the labor government. So each successive labor government allowed more and more um, inflationary practices. So their economy was devastated and uh, it, was, it was just a bad, bad period. The period of 78 to 79 was known as the winter of discontent. So how bad does it need to be to, to be, receive a label like that? Far worse than we had in the U.S. You know, it's, yeah, I think it's also, Garrett, it's also important to remember that, uh, you know, Margaret Thatcher pursued a, a policy of, uh, of national recovery for Great Britain. And, uh, you know, just, just she had this incredible energy and, uh, and determination, and that's, that's where this reputation as the, as the Iron Lady uh, really came from. Yeah, the Soviets call her that for being so strong. But uh, she's been, she was controversial as well in, in England itself and with some of the, the policies that they, that they put into place. And there was certainly some, uh, some, a lot of negative impacts, which eventually became positive. But at that time, things were very tough during that transition period. You know, I, I think it's important that our audience remember that Margaret Thatcher became one of the founders with Ronald Reagan of a school of conservative conviction. Uh, and, and that school has had a powerful and an enduring impact on politics in Britain and in the United States uh, here. And, and she, she earned a higher international profile globally than any British politician since Winston Churchill. Just an, just, just an amazing, amazing woman. And I would say other than Tony Blair, probably since as well. Just an incredible. Let's, um, Garrett, just kind of start this program. Uh, let, let's see if we can get a little bit of uh, the, the uh, voice of Margaret Thatcher. And Mr. Producer, if you would play uh, uh, audio clip number one for us here. And we'll have her... If you look throughout history, and even recent history, tyrannies are defeated not by groups of nations. They're defeated by strong nation states with strong conviction that someone who carries out an aggression must be stopped. That didn't happen by the European community. Look at Bosnia. It didn't happen by the United Nations. It happened because, in the case of Falklands, because Britain had strong convictions and strong defense. It happened when we had the Libyan raid uh, against terrorism because President Reagan and myself had strong convictions that terrorism must not be allowed to go on without any reaction to it. When it came to the Gulf, it was uh, President Bush and myself, nations with strong convictions convictions that you must stop an aggressor before he goes further. You cannot do without strong nation states confident in their own political system, confident in their own democracy. And that has been much more important in the history of this century than any European group. And therefore my vision of Europe is we cooperate together in a free and friendly way as democracies as nations strong in our own identity and strong in our own loyalty. But to have such leaders today, David. Boy, incredible, incredible. How we've made these points repeatedly. Piece. Indeed, Mr. Let's, Chairman. Uh, we'll get into that second clip uh, a little further on in the, in the show here. Um, that was actually post her prime ministership. So that would have been somewhere, I believe, 
in the late 90s. So she was relatively elderly at that point, but the power and the conviction is still certainly there. You know, that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that voice of, uh, as you say, a, a, of a leader that it would sure be nice if we had that in the United States now. Yeah, we don't have the clip, I don't believe, but the, the speech he gave to the commons when they were launching the Falklands War was a tour de force. It was as good as anything Winston Churchill has done. Uh, and she was at the very pinnacle, really, of her career at that point. Um, and her popularity surged from then. Um, let's, let's get a couple little interesting factoids about uh, Margaret Thatcher here, kind of in the, in the broad brush approach. Uh, uh, she was known as the grocer's daughter. What is that all about? Yeah, her, her, they grew up in a little above a shop, a store that her father owned. He was a counselor, a preacher, I think he was a, a minister. Um, so she really started with basic roots. Uh, she was a scholarship girl, so she got scholarships all the way through from Grantham School all the way to Oxford, uh, which is very impressive. And you, you know, understanding the, the um, hierarchical system over there in England at the time, and you know, still somewhat today, to be able to go from such humble beginnings to the prime ministership and indeed to a baroness um, was pretty amazing. I mean, she, again, an outstanding achievement. Uh, for anybody, in particular for Margaret Thatcher. When she went through this, the British education system, and rose up through with, with this, this, this scholarship, you know, she, she was coming from a, a lower middle class, a working class background, right? That's right. That's, that's right. He, I mean, her father was a, an outstanding uh, counselor and politician, and was probably a large por portion of her development, especially as a conservative, uh, which she, you know, she leaned as a conservative very early on in life. Uh, she was a chemist. She studied uh, chemistry in college and also law. And she actually practiced both. I mean, find a politician today who, <laughs> you know, maybe taught in, you know, in a college or something like that. But she was actually a, a real-life uh, chemist and uh, lawyer. And um, then she moved on. After she met Dennis, her, her husband, Dennis Thatcher, who um, gave her some of the means to be able to enter into the politics because they were, became more comfortable. He was from oil money, basically, a, a okay. oil business. And uh, then she spread her wings within, on the political side and uh, you know, ventured in, eventually becoming PM. What, what, just so that our audience can really appreciate it, what was Britain's condition when Margaret Thatcher rose to leadership? So we're talking about the period 1978, 1979. What, how would you describe that for our audience? She took over as PM 79. Okay. Uh, four years, I believe, before is where she became head of the Conservative Party. So you had a period of utter stagnation and Britain going from uh, ending World War II as a, you know, a leading country in the world, uh, but you know, severely damaged by all the bombing and everything from right. executing They're the war against to Germany. Rubble. Reduced to rubble. Immediately after the war, of course, they, uh, they fired uh, Winston Churchill, and a la successive Labour governments came on. They did things such as national, the national health system. Um, they nationalized a lot of the major businesses um, things such as mining, uh, iron production, uh, British aerospace, all of those major car production. Everything was basically done by the same people who bring you the, the post office, right? So we had a deterioration in management and the overall country in general. They had rapid inflation, uh, terrible interest rates. Uh, unemployment was double, well and truly double digit. So they were 20%. truly the sick man of Europe. They were the sick man of Europe. And more socialist than even France? Oh, at that time, very much so. So when, when you see what she inherited, to within three or four years to turn it around and to, to launch England on a, uh, a new system under Thatcherism, right. uh, to have it still pretty much implemented at this point, uh, just it stands to you know her accomplishment and achievements. You know we're going to go to a break in a moment here, um, but I, what I want the audience to 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 appreciate is that this uh, this picture that Garrett has painted uh, of the British economy is something that if you look at Britain today you wouldn't see that. Yeah, the dominance of the labor unions was the primarily part she, what she destroyed. There's more. When we come back, stay with us. So 
760 KGU. Part of the Wall Street Business Network. No problem heading over to the windward side on the Poly, the Lee K, Lee K, or the H3. On the upper windward coast, though, we got an accident, Kamehameha Highway, in front of the La Ia Foodland store. The drive east to Hawaii Kai is normal. The drive west got slow early this afternoon because of an accident. H1 is already backed up on the airport viaduct in the Moanalua right after Middle Street. Inbound traffic slows at the Middle Street merge. I can't at the moment. Okay. Um, so it may be totally different. So then we'll we'll have to deal with that quickly and then move into this because this Got is a, it. this is this is an important section here, and there's a lot to that for a 12 or 15 minute piece. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, okay. How long we got? We have probably 60 seconds more here. You folks okay over there? I'm sorry you can't hear everything, and so you're, it's like, it's not nearly as entertaining as all the music and all the other good stuff that, that Imagine Margaret Thatcher's voice in my head. <laughs> That's not okay. <laughs> so, uh, now that we have this show kind of set up, Laura, if, to the extent that there's, if there's a comment or question you want to raise, just get my attention before you move to that. Sure that microphone and then why don't you you know if you're going to do that just uh, move over to it or pick it up and move it gently to you yeah Pacific Forum CSIS is a nonprofit nonpartisan foreign policy organization affiliated with the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington DC from right here in Honolulu, Pacific Forum has, since 1975, provided analysis on current and emerging political, economic, business, and security issues for leaders throughout the U.S. and Asia. Also, the Pacific Forum Young Leaders Program brings young professionals and next-generation leaders from around the U.S., Asia, and Europe together to observe and participate in high-level, multinational dialogues normally reserved for senior policy experts. To provide your support for the Young Leaders Program and to send future generation leaders abroad to ensure peace and prosperity in the Pacific, please contact Pacific Forum at 808-521-6745. That's 808-521-6745. Or you can visit them on the web at pacforum.org. That's P-A-C forum.org. Your product is selling well locally, so why export? Because 95% of all consumers live in foreign markets. Why not expand your market and increase your sales with help from the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone, your hub of international trade in Hawaii. The Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone offers you the services and support you need to start, grow, and succeed in your import-export business. Find them on at forward slash dash Hawaii at www.ftz9.org. You're listening to Asia in Review Thursday on the Think Tech Radio Series here on AM760 KGU. Now here once again is your host, David Day. We are back. We are live. And you can join this program by calling us at area code 808-296-5467. We're talking today about Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady is no more. And our host, or our host, geez, our guest is Mr. <laughs> Garrett Grace, a, uh, a former uh, Irish resident, resident of the UK, and uh, formerly served in the Australian Navy to give us uh, kind of the, the Commonwealth perspective on Margaret Thatcher. And uh, before, Garrett, before we go back to you, let me bring the... Uh, uh, CEO of uh, Think Tech, our producer uh, on board with us, uh, General Jay Fidel. Jay? Hi, David. Thank you. Uh, I want to take a moment to remind everybody that Think Tech live streams all of its talk shows live on the internet. We put streaming video on Ustream and streaming audio on Spreaker. If you want to catch us live, these video and audio streams are, are available on our website, which is thinktechhawaii.com. Check them out there. 
Remember, too, that we have a gallery for a live audience in our downtown ThinkTech studio, as today. You can come down and be a member of that audience. You can pose questions to our guests and participate in the discussion. To reserve your place, write to me, jfidel at j at fidel.com. Thanks to you, David. Back to you. All right. Uh, right at the before the break, Garrett, we you mentioned about the uh, labor unions, and uh, uh, I think that uh, you know that that kind of leads into a, a piece of uh, the whole Thatcher uh, background, history, and legacy that we talk about, and that's the controversial Margaret Thatcher, the piece that uh, that took so much heat uh, and, and bitterness from different quarters. Yeah, as a as a, a con uh, conviction politician you tend to create enemies or people who don't like you and Margaret certainly uh, followed that mold. What was the, the, the condition or situation, political bent if you will, of the union leadership in the UK uh, at the time that she took office? We I talked about socialists before. but Yeah, so, socialism was, uh, was rampant and one of the big problems was that the conservatives had a go along to get along type attitude. So for many years um, over the, the go, post-war go, period. Go, go along to get along? So they That's were, kind of like a, a John McCain and Lindsey Graham kind of concept, right? <laughs> Some, something close. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably not quite that bad. But uh, anyway, they, they, they certainly went. So they, uh, as these issues came forward, they, they went along with a lot of it. And it, no matter how detrimental it was overall, they wanted to impress the voters, so they went along with it. Uh, she broke the mold and said, no, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to go in a new direction. All right, but the union leadership at the time that she took over, they were socialist or I would further say, left than that? I would say Stalinist, easy, especially when you, you're looking at the, the coal miners. And they fought pitch battles, I mean, far worse than anything we went on with Ronald Reagan uh, with the air traffic controllers. That was minor compared to what happened in England. There was actually a full year of a coal strike, and coal is the primary heating source in much of England. Okay. So huge part for, for everything, the entire, all the industries that ran on coal, so the, the uh, electricity. So the unions were effectively trying to lock down the country. Yes, and they, they, have, they were very effective at doing it. The first time it happened, well, it happened all through the 70s, but uh, in the early part of Thatcher's um, prime ministership, uh, she ended up having to cave to them. So the, the thought that she 100% was always blocking the unions is not really true. It's a myth. Uh, it wasn't until she had really prepared the ground um, and prepared to be able to manage the UK through a long extended strike is that she finally uh, was able to put, the, put everything in place to break that union. And it was definitely, I think even most people in England, while they might be, find it a bit distasteful what ended up happening, but it sure turned that whole economy around when they were able to get the unions to be a bit more realistic. Let's, um, I want to come back to unions if we have time later, but I want to jump to a different topic because y you have the benefit of having lived in Ireland. And uh, certainly there was a controversial part of Margaret Thatcher that, that had to do with the whole issue of Northern Ireland. And uh, tell us about that. What, what, you were there yeah, on the, on the yeah. scene at the time. Yeah, I can honestly say I have a, maybe a love-hate relationship because, you know, as an Irishman, um, you know, you have that old saying about one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. And for a lot of right. Irish, most Irish people, um, we definitely feel that the Northern Irish situation was a political issue that needed to be solved politically. I understand. Um, her position was simply that this is crime and there would be no uh, nope. benefit given to any of the, the IRA prisoners. And no quarter. Uh, in the north. No quarter, basically. And there, there was a lot of bad things happened during that time. So she took a very hard, hard line on that whole situation. Uh, ten hunger strikers died, one after the other. I was a young man in Ireland, and I still remember when Bobby Sands uh, died, finally, after a long, long period of starvation. And to, it was almost a feeling of disbelief that a modern Western society would allow something like that to happen and give no quarter whatsoever. And I think history has taught us that the eventual solutions in Ireland, Northern Ireland, have been political. So that tells me that that fight was a political fight and uh, the, the hunger strikers did have a, uh, a reason, rationale, and it, it, they, there probably should have been something that was uh, helped to solve it. But 
Margaret Thatcher was very strong. Um, she held a strong um, attitude on that, and it didn't matter how many of them died. They were she was going to continue the uh, the British rule and not give in at all. So that that whole situation really fits with her title as the Iron Lady because she wasn't going to move. Is there a reason for that? Why, why did she have this? Well, view some would say bloody determination. I think uh, Maggie Thatcher had a few. Um, issues or thoughts of what she wanted to achieve and she was bloody minded. She would not stop against the unions, she would not stop against the IRA or any other terrorist groups and she would not stop until uh, the UK was transformed into what she saw it as being um, the right way or her way. What about the EU? She, she took a controversial position and stance vis-a-vis -vis Britain's participation in the EU, EU, didn't she? And I think, frankly, she was probably right. And I think it, a number of the issues that she pointed out as being controversial at that point turned out to be spot on. When you remove, if you remove the Brit Britain from the pound um, and be, go into the, the euro, you remove a lot of the, the ability of a sovereign to maneuver through right. interest rates, through monetary valuation. And she firmly believed that by doing the European Union without a full, full economic and governmental union, right. it was going to fail or bound to fail. And of course, we're seeing that issue now and the benefit, frankly, to the UK of having their own currency, where they are able to exist outside of that Euro zone. And there are probably many, many bankers, uh, your your compadres in London, oh, very who much. are saying, "Thank, thank God. God Almighty, thank God for Maggie, thank, thank God for Maggie." Yeah, and she wasn't totally against the EU. She was heavily involved was supportive. with moving England closer to a trading partnership, but it was giving up that sovereignty is what she refused to do, and every subsequent Labour government and Conservative government that have been in place have maintained the same policy, so I think it proved out right in the long run. Let's uh, go, Mr. Producer, to, uh, if we could, to uh, uh, audio clip number two of Margaret Thatcher. Uh, if you could do that, that would be awesome. And, uh, you know, every time I hear the voice of Margaret Thatcher, it, that uh, uh, it really... Now we've made these points special. repeatedly. Indeed, Mr. Chairman, I'm accused of lecturing or preaching about them. I suppose it's a critic's way of saying, well, we know it's true, but we've got a carpet something. I don't care about that, but I do care about the future of free enterprise, the jobs and exports it provides, and the independence it brings to our people. Independence? Yes, but let us be clear what we mean by that. Independence doesn't mean contracting out of all relationships with others. A nation can be free, but it won't stay free for long if it has no friends and no alliances. Above all, it won't stay free if it can't pay its own way in the world. And by the same token, an individual needs to be part of a community and to feel that he is part of it. There's more to this than the chance to earn a living for himself and his family, essential though that is. Of course, our vision and our aims go far beyond the complex arguments of economics. But unless we get the economy right, we shall deny our people the opportunity to share that vision and to see beyond the narrow horizons of economic necessity. Without a healthy economy, we can't have a healthy society. And without a healthy society, the economy won't stay healthy for long. Mr. Chairman, but it isn't the state that creates a healthy society. For when the state grows too powerful, people feel that they count for less and less. The state drains society not only of its wealth, but of initiative, of energy, the will to improve and innovate, as well as to preserve what is best. But our aim is to let people feel that they count for more and more. 
If we can't trust the deepest instincts of our people, we shouldn't be in politics at all. Wow, if we can't trust the deepest instincts of our people, we shouldn't be in politics at all. It's really American. It's a very American way of thinking, and, right? Yeah, and, Total and, common sense. And, and, and it isn't the state that creates a healthy economy. Wow. Yeah, it could have been Reagan. Could have been Reagan. And when you think of the context, I mean, the England, a third of gross domestic product was through state-owned industries. The top tax rate, 98% on investment income. And she rolled that back. And she rolled it back to a flat rate of about 40%. Good. So huge and stimulated at the same time. The things that you know you and I you know, talk about all the time. I mean, you, you low taxes, freedom. Uh, those are the, the priorities that we should be pushing. And you, you push those things, the, the economy does take off. Boy, you know, when you hear her voice, it just, just uh, ah, gives me, uh, uh, as we say here in Hawaii, chicken skin. Chicken skin. Well, we will have, be back with more chicken skin after the break. Stay with us. 760 KGU. Part of the Wall Street Business Network. I'm so sorry. In town, got an accident on Dillingham Boulevard in front of Gaspro. On the Upper Windward Coast, an accident in front of the Food Land in Hawaii. And in town, there's an accident in front of McDonald's on KAMU. No problems to Hawaii Kai or to the Windward side. If you're going west, the H1 is stopped and go about halfway back on the airport viaduct from Juana Lewis slows right after Middle Street. Inbound traffic from the west slows at Ola Lane. So the silence part of the uh, commercial break is when the studio is is doing a national yeah. broadcast. Yes, so we can't we can't hear that. And it's <coughs> Cold War. Cold War. Are you having fun? Oh yeah. Fun, fun, fun. You're doing Relaxing fabulous. It. This is. Every time I hear her voice, though, it really throws me emotionally. You know, mm. Just wow. I get that on Reagan. He has the uh, intellectual ability to. Cut. Hawaii, the state of clean energy, is also brought to you by so Hawaiian Electric Company, well. powering the growth and development yes. of Hawaii since it was chartered by King yeah, Kalakaua in 1891. But Today, Hawaiian Electric and its subsidiaries, and Maui Electric and Hawaii really Electric Light time. Company, serve it more than 95% of our state, providing reliable electric Nowadays, service essential to our quality of life. The Hawaiian Electric Companies are also leading our transition to clean energy by increasing our renewable energy use and improving energy efficiency, we're reducing Hawaii's dependence on imported oil and in providing a more sustainable and secure future for Hawaii. For more information, visit hawaiisenergyfuture.com. Hawaii, the state of clean energy, is also brought to you by the State Energy Office of the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. How can we secure a better future for Hawaii? One way is clean energy. And the State Energy Office is steering Hawaii to that clean energy future. Hawaii is rich with natural renewable resources, the sun, the wind, the ocean, and the land. And they are all being tapped to meet Hawaii's clean energy initiatives to generate electricity, create jobs, spur economic growth, and reduce our dependence on imported foreign oil. To learn more, visit energy.hawaii.gov. You're listening to Asia in Review Thursday on the Think Tech Radio series here on AM760 KGU. Now here once again is your host, David Day. We are back. We're live. And uh, you can join the conversation by calling us at area code 808-296-5467. Um, we have in our studio audience a group from a public radio station in Telluride, Colorado. And uh, as Jay mentioned at the prior break, you can always uh, 
contact uh, us at Think Tech Hawaii to, to uh, reserve your spot to join in the studio audience. And uh, speaking of Jay Fidel, let me bring, uh, bring on the great CEO of Think Tech. Thank you, David. And welcome to Tell Your Ride National Radio, what local radio part of NPR. Okay, I want to talk about something that is close to our heart in Asia in review. Uh, Think Tech and the Hawaii Venture Capital Association on April 25th, as one of our regular monthly uh, lunch and panel programs, is presenting a program <coughs> called Hawaii's Growing Financial Connection with Asia and How We Can Make It Grow All the Faster uh, at the Plaza Club. You know, Hawaii is the bridge to Asia. Can, can Hawaii be on that bridge? Uh, what is the extent of Hawaii's effort so far, and what can we do now? Uh, we do have growing financial connection with Asia. With this program, we're going to illuminate uh, Hawaii's position on the bridge. So come and see Varian Allen, investment manager with Merrill Lynch. Lots of years of experience in Asia. He's the moderator, Stephen Cornell, Roger Epstein, a tax attorney, David Day. Where have I heard that name? David Day will be on this program, and Brad Punu, all experts in Asia and in financial arrangements in and with Asia. Come down to Hawaii's growing financial connection with Asia on April 25th, Thursday. Sign up at hvca.org. Thank you, David. Back to you. Thank you, Jay. And um, ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking about kind of the, the, the memory or the, the leg and the legacy of the Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher, in this program. Our guest is Mr. Garrett Grace, who is a former resident of, the, uh, of Ireland and the UK uh, and uh, served in the Australian Navy. He wears the stamp of the, uh, the British Commonwealth all over him, although he doesn't have the uh, coat of arms on his shirt here uh, with us in the studio today. And uh, in this program so far, we talked a little bit about the, the early background of, of, of Margaret Thatcher and, and a little bit about the, the controversial side of Margaret Thatcher. Um, and next, Garrett, let's, let's talk uh, with our audience, because there are many people who don't really understand the pivotal role that she played in ending the Cold War. And uh, let me take you to a scene. Just imagine here, uh, I'm Helmut Kohl, uh, the Chancellor of West... Uh, West Germany at the time, Germany is divided, and um, I'm going to provide a platform for the American president to do something, and so I get Ronald Reagan within absolute spitting distance of the Berlin Wall, and uh, in the course of, uh, of that, of course, that's when Reagan makes this very famous statement. Tear down this wall. Tear down this wall, Mr. Right. Gorbachev. And uh, uh, a lot of Americans perhaps do not understand the role that Lady Margaret Thatcher played in, in, in the whole ending of the Cold War. And my understanding is that, that uh, she was the one who actually introduced Gorbachev to Ronald Reagan. Uh, am, am, I, am I right? Or do I yeah, that's, something that, that's right. When you, when, you, when you think about it, we had the Revolutionary War. You had you know, Washington, Franklin, Madison, the right people at the right time, Lincoln, Civil War. And with the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, the potential end, as the Soviets were weakening and weakening, we had Reagan, we had Thatcher, we had uh, Gorbachev at, at the right time, and John Paul, of course. Uh, Brian Mulroney played another role. But yes, so there, you had the right people at the right time, and one of them was Margaret Thatcher. She was a major anti-Soviet politician. She felt in her heart of hearts it was wrong it was not the freedom that she believed in and she took every step she could including uh, introducing um, that she could do business with Gorbachev and that's actually how she put it she told Ronald Reagan that she thought she could she do could business, do business with, with she could do business, business with this guy, guy. yes wow so th yes she had a she had a major role on it she also told uh, George Bush, you know, not to go wobbly on Saddam Hussein. So she's got a history of uh, telling U.S. presidents <laughs> <laughs> at the right time what to do. And uh, we've seen some of the benefits from that. What well, you mentioned uh, Pope, Pope John Paul in the list there. What was his role in ending the Cold War, and how did that tie in with Margaret Thatcher? What's, what's, his, what's his piece? Well, he was heavily involved. He was a Pole. Okay. So he felt deeply about the... Um, the, the Poles being under the boot of the Soviet Union. And of course, when he arrived uh, for his trip to Poland back there in the early 80s and uh, said that you know, 
almost the same type of uh, statement about tearing down this wall or to free. And he gave an impetus to like Willensa and uh, solidarity movement that they didn't have really before that and created that energy. Okay. And she was, she was part of it, so maybe not a core portion of the Polish part, but she was definitely part of that whole axis that came together to uh, to weaken first and then eventually to destroy the, the Soviet Union. What was, uh, you know, the, there, you mentioned a list of names, and the other one that I thought you, uh, we talked about uh, Helmut Kohl briefly, but in a, in a different way, what, what was the role, I think you mentioned the, the role of the, the Canadian Prime Minister, Brian, oh, Brian Mulroney. Mulroney. What, yes. what, how, does that, how does he fit into this, this picture? He was, he was part of that group of conservative leaders that were there at the right time with uh, the way the Soviet Union was. There was a lot of things that the U.S. Wouldn't, was not, were not able to achieve because of being the, the U.S. If they inserted themselves into certain uh, controversies, they, it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't show up very well. It wouldn't come out very well. Whereas the Canadians were able to achieve a lot of things behind the scenes. For and instance, Mulroney was. For, for instance, we saw recently that uh, the movie of uh, getting our per embassy personnel out of uh, Argo, Argo out of okay. uh, out of Tehran. So you know, little bits of that were heavily influenced by uh, Brian, Brian Mulroney. What's the um, uh, the the piece of the question that that has has always uh, confounded me a bit was this the the whole issue of a, a, a non-nuclear Europe that Thatcher and Reagan stood up against can you give us a little bit of background on that because that to me looks like it, it was a pretty yeah. pretty pivotal stance that they it, took it, it was and the, the the peace lobby was heavily heavily in, um, in involved with uh, the Soviets. I mean, the Soviets had infiltrated. They were supplying the money to drive a lot of these things. These are all pretty well documented now at this point. Uh, so the heavy Soviet influence, uh, the old term uh, useful idiots that we uh, know from, uh, from Lenin. But when she allowed the uh, Reagan to put the um, Minuteman missile into, uh, into England, uh, they drew a line in the sand, effectively, for the Soviets and any thought of expansion or at least, you know, being able to attack uh, the U.S. Um, so that was a big part. The other part was, of course, uh, Tripoli. She allowed um, U.S. bombers to fly from England, the U.K. bases, to bomb Tripoli. So showing that she had the solidarity with uh, the, the, the goals of uh, Ronald Reagan and the U.S. in general. Took a lot of flack. Took an awful lot of flack. It was, one point in time where tens of thousands of Brightons got together in a huge chain okay. all around the country in protest. But she stood her own, and again, the, the uh, Soviet Union eventually uh, collapsed. The other part was the Falklands was a, was a huge part, and there was some, somewhat of a, another coordination with the, uh, the, the U.S., where the U.S. didn't overtly support the Brits except for some refueling. But uh, they they held a lot of other parts okay. off in the um, in the UN uh, and places allowed the the Brits to go down and effectively uh, reestablish their their uh, ownership of those islands. So the the, the these particular prime ministers uh, you know, Thatcher playing an important part from West Germany, Helmut Kohl from Canada, Brian Mulroney, the Pope John Paul, along with Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, all locked arms together. And these type of uh, things, like the minute missiles, the, the non-nuclear Europe, and, and bases uh, to, to bomb Tripoli, locking s arms together like this forced the cracks to start so that when Reagan made his pitch to tear down the wall, it eventually crumbled of its own accord. It was, some, some. It was, it was very weak, and I believe they, they, they showed the weakness, and it couldn't stand up once everybody saw that the emperor had no clothes. Okay, Mr. Producer, if you're there with us, uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to get ready for another audio clip after the break here. Great. Seven sixty KGU, part of the Wall Street Business Network. 
Got some heavy traffic going west this afternoon because of earlier problems. H1 slows at the airport exit on the viaduct. Uh, the Moana Lewis slows right at Middle Street. Why is that? Complicating the trip west is an accident on the Pearl City on-ramp to the H1 Everbound. Inbound traffic from the west slows at Ola Lane. Stay slow until you get through the Ward Avenue bottleneck. No problems to the windward side, more normal to Hawaii Kai. You do. You do. You want me to go outside of my cell phone? <laughs> no, 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 just go for so it. So we don't have any callers, I assume? Oh, well, at least not yet. I can't. I haven't seen anything here, but I don't know if she can reach me. Do you normally have callers? We usually get uh, one, two sometimes. Not a lot. And this no, is all, no it's cranks. A topic that people They're don't usually know. very high intellectual types, callers that call in. Um, would you would you like questions? Would that help you in the show, or would you prefer to continue with your, your question? Well, I think a question is always good. So what we'll what we'll do after the break is is uh, I want to take another audio clip of Margaret Thatcher, and then um, talking about the legacy. Uh, we're going to go into the legacy of Margaret Thatcher, but I'd like to take whatever comments you or Lauren may have. Okay. I do have a question about her legacy. Actually. Okay. Okay, okay, good. So give me your first name again. Lance. Lance. Think Tech always brings unparalleled media depth to its programs, and our show Asia in Review is no exception. The Thursday Asia Business and Foreign Policy shows here on Think Tech are hosted by David Day, a well known international lawyer with extensive experience in the business and geopolitical issues of the Asia Pacific region. Come join, David, as ThinkTech illuminates Hawaii's bridge to Asia with fascinating and lively discussions, featuring experts who unwind the critical issues and then probe for the solutions. Asia in Review with David Day. ThinkTech Hawaii is a Hawaii nonprofit corporation organized in the year 2000. Its purpose is to raise public awareness about the importance of technology, energy, agriculture, and globalism to the diversification and expansion of our economy. We do this by television shows on community television and on OC16, by newspaper articles, and by our ThinkTech radio series on KGU 760 AM. We also do it by panel programs and events, including our monthly luncheon programs with the Hawaii Venture Capital Association. ThinkTech, working to raise public awareness in Hawaii. Check us out at thinktechhawaii.com. You're listening to Asia in Review Thursday on the Think Tech Radio Series here on AM 760 KGU. Now here once again is your host, David Day. We are back. We're live and we're talking about the Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher. We're going to be winding up the show talking about her enduring legacy. Uh, what is it and is it enduring? Our, our guest is uh, Mr. Garrett Grace, a former resident of Ireland in the UK. Um, and he's also served in the Australian Navy, and I like to joke with him that he has the stamp of the Commonwealth all <laughs> over the back of his shirt there. And uh, But before we continue, Garrett, I'd like to play another uh, audio clip to uh, so that some of the folks in our audience maybe who haven't heard some of these wonderful It's pieces, wonderful to hear her voice. Hear her voice uh, that is with us no more. Mr. Producer, if you would run uh, clip number three for us, that'd be awesome. With each day, it becomes clearer that in the wider world, we face darkening horizons, and the war between Iran and Iraq is the latest symptom of a deeper malady. Europe and North America are centers of stability in an increasingly anxious world. The community and the alliance are the guarantee to other countries that democracy and freedom of choice are still possible. They stand for order and the rule of law in an age when disorder and lawlessness are ever more widespread. The British government intends to stand by both these great institutions, the community and NATO. We will not betray them. There she is, that wonderful, wonderful Margaret Thatcher. And you knew when she said things like that, she meant it and she'd follow through. Yeah. The restoration of Britain's place in the world and of the West's confidence in its own destiny are two aspects of the same process. 
No doubt there'll be unexpected twists in the road, but with wisdom and resolution, we can reach our goal. I believe we'll show the wisdom, and you may be certain that we'll show the resolution. Mr. Chairman, in his warm-hearted and generous speech, Peter Thornycroft said that when people are called upon to lead great nations, they must look into the hearts and minds of the people whom they seek to govern. So powerful. I would add that those who seek to govern must in turn be willing to allow their hearts and minds to lie open to the people. Wow. That's what? a conviction politician. Unbelievable. She laid it out, yep. and they voted for her three times, three successive times. Incredible. You know, uh, the concept that, that people who govern must be willing to lay open their hearts yep. uh, is something that, you know, again, as you said at the beginning of this program, I wish we had leaders like that today. Yeah. yeah. Nowadays, we, we they tend to hide a lot of the yeah. what they desire because it's not popular. Yeah, they hide and spin it. It's, it's spun or it's you know poll tested. Whereas obviously she would uh, lay it out, and everybody knew what they were getting. You know, we have a we have a caller or a participant from our studio audience here. Uh, uh, welcome to Asian Review, and uh, give give a, give us your first name if you would. My name is Laura. Laura, where are you from? Telluride, Colorado. Telluride, Colorado. Colorado. Deep in the Rockies. High in the Rockies. High in the Rockies. Okay. Uh, what's your What's your question or comment? Uh, well, this this gets back a little bit to the clip you played previously, in which Margaret Thatcher said uh, something along the lines of, "If we can't trust the deepest instincts of our people, then we shouldn't be governing." And um, some might argue that the the deepest instincts of the people um, were against the Falklands War and conflict and. I'm just curious if you could comment on that part of her legacy. And Garrett, you mentioned that you, you felt that fit in with, with the end of the Cold War, if you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, it was 1983, if I recall correctly. Um, initially, there was a lot of controversy uh, within, the, within the parliament, uh, very much in keeping with the uh, pacifist um, side of the, on the Labour Party side, but even some of the conservatives as well. Um, the the war initially was was quite devastating for the Brits. They lost about 250 to 300 of their sailors um, on a couple of sh on six ships that they lost. Uh, but eventually, um, it turned and the attitude turned, and it was looked upon as a great success um, uh, in in England. And to this day, the Falklands are still British, uh, no matter what the Argentinians say. Now, the other part of her question had to do with um, the. Uh, controversy within the British population as to the Falklands. Yes, sometimes it take, it's leadership. Sometimes you have to do things that aren't necessarily popular in the beginning. Um, and when you're a conviction politician such as Margaret Thatcher and you see a, a bigger picture, uh, which is what I believe she saw in the Falklands, uh, where she would not give up those colonists to an invading force, uh, whether you agree or disagree with it, I think that was uh, definitely a conviction that she uh, was willing to stand up for, and it was effective. You know, I saw something recently where the, the population in the Falklands today, very, very grateful that they are, they are still connected with the UK. Yeah, I think it was over 99%, so I think they're still trying to hunt down the 1%. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get that guy. Yeah, yeah. We have another question uh, from our studio audience here. Uh, sir, what is your, can you give us your name? Yes, my name is Lance. And Lance, uh, uh, can I assume you might be from deep in the Rockies as well? It's true. Welcome to Hawaii here. Thank you. <laughs> it's welcome. a lovely place. And I've got a Aloha. question uh, regarding Thatcher's economic legacy, and it's a two-part question. The first, earlier in the show you discussed some of her ways to crank up the British economy. One was to privatize a number of industries. And I'm curious if you could tell me some of those industries that she did privatize, Gavin. It, is, it, is that the... the That's my first part. Okay, then, we'll get to the second yeah. part. Okay, yeah, privatize. Probably, probably easier that way. Yeah. The steel industry was a big, big part of it. Uh, my own grandfather was a steel worker, mm -hmm. and he was made redundant. So I saw and experienced the, the turmoil when you shut down an entire town yes. and put everybody out of work without any replacement jobs. That's very, very painful. 
Um, so I've experienced that myself. Um, the British aerospace industry was all government run. Uh, the, all of the car industry, and they really don't have a, any British vehicles anymore. Um, they, were very, they were bad. <laughs> they, they produced <laughs> junk, and to this day it's still considered junk. And um, you know, th those have improved now as they were sold off to other, um, other groups. The coal industry was another one that was all um, public or owned by the government, and mm -hmm. that, that part was also uh, was sold off, and that's, that's a, bit, a bit more successful. Before you get to the second, second part of your question, uh, Mr. Producer, if you would just stand by, don't play it yet, but let's get audio clip number one ready to go. Don't play it yet, but second part of your question, sir. Yes. Knowing that she has successfully privatized those groups, it's impossible to go backwards. And as a citizen of the uh, Commonwealth, do you believe that there's anything lost from those policies? Or do you feel like she did make the right decision and it was the only way forward? Every government that's come after Margaret Thatcher left as prime minister have supported and actually expanded uh, those programs. So I think Thatcherism as an economic uh, policy or theory has very much established itself as a, a success within Britain. Now there's a lot, of, uh, Britain has come back a bit in a number of cases um, for sure. Uh, expansion of the, uh, under the labor, uh, labor relations side, uh, the national health system and things like that. So yeah, they definitely have issues, but it's nowhere near what it was in the late 70s when Margaret took over the premiership. All right, Mr. Producer, if you would uh, uh, play audio clip number one for our audience, that'd be, that'd be great. If you look throughout history, and even recent history, tyrannies are defeated not by groups of nations. They're defeated by strong nation states with strong conviction that someone who carries out an aggression must be stopped. That didn't happen by the European community. Look at Bosnia. It didn't happen by the United Nations. It happened because, in the case of Falklands, because Britain had strong convictions and strong defense. It happened when we had the Libyan raid uh, against terrorism because President Reagan and myself had strong convictions that terrorism must not be allowed to go on without any reaction to it. When it came to the Gulf, it was uh, President Bush and myself, nations with strong convictions convictions that you must stop an aggressor before he goes further. You cannot do without strong nation states confident in their own political system, confident in their own democracy. And that has been much more important in the history of this century than in a European group. And therefore my vision of Europe is we cooperate together in a free and friendly way as democracies. As she was definitely the original neocon. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Garrett. Oh, uh, you're so welcome. This, is, this has been a uh, fascinating program. And uh, Margaret Thatcher, we will miss you. And uh, the Iron Lady is no more. And, and uh, I believe she still lives on. She, she, lives she, on. she has really uh, given us a, an incredible legacy, uh, both in terms of economic policy, but boy, there was a message in that last, that last quote of hers to uh, the current leadership in this country having to deal with uh, instability and national security challenges around the world oh, to, very much so. to stand firm. Uh, we hope that you'll join us next week, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for Asian Review. And I am David Day, and we are signing off here. Please have a safe drive home. Thank you for listening.